Um, so we're going to get started here. I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Julia Bird. Uh, she's one of my co-residents. We're uh, in our first year of residency. Uh, Dr. Bird uh, graduated from medical school at the uh, University of New Mexico. Uh, we all heard about Dr. Bird's uh, career as a child actress a few weeks ago when uh, she was introduced, uh, but she also has other talents. Uh, she is a former ballerina, which uh, apparently makes you really good at rock climbing. Uh, we had a mini resident retreat this past weekend, uh, and Dr. Bird was the fastest person to make it up the more difficult route, beating out co-residents uh, and a few faculty and staff guest stars. Uh, she's going to give us a neuro-ophthalmology case of optic neuropathy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to be going a, over a case we saw in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic. <coughs> this was a patient who came in in February. He was referred for a history of NAION in the left eye and some kind of continued vision loss. He's a 56-year-old man, and his kind of main complaint was decreasing vision or decreased vision in the left eye for the past three years. Um, he, you know, the story is a little unclear, but he said he, he remembered a f acute onset of painless blurred vision, but that has progressed over time. He has some distortion, um, missing areas of vision in that left eye, and he's noticed that colors are um, definitely diminished and not quite as vivid in that eye. But over the past couple months, he's also noticed some changes in his right eye. You know, he can't describe it more than just kind of some blurry vision, um, distortion of vision. He's also, in general, had some increased glare and some floaters that are unchanged. So in 2013, he reports he saw an outside ophthalmologist who said he might have had a stroke in his left eye. We didn't have any records from this visit, um, but 2014, he said his vision continued to decrease to almost nothing. It was count fingers in the left eye. Again, no records. This is just from his account. He's seen multiple ophthalmologists kind of since then, but finally got referred to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic. Past medical history, he's really quite a healthy gentleman. He had some headaches for the past few years, but he kind of correlated with the onset of his blurry vision, um, but they're kind of in the nasal temporal region. They can radiate anywhere. They are variable for how long they last, either dull, achy pressure pain or a sharp pain, no associated photophobia, phonophobia, nausea or vomiting, no history of migraines in the past, um, no eye pain associated with this. He's just on allopurinol and um, albuterol. He you know, lives in Idaho, owns a general store, no cigarette use, a few, occasional alcohol. Um, family history really is just significant for a father who had a blood vessel occlusion. We don't know exactly what happened, um, but when he was 83. Kind of a review of systems. The only positive that he was elicited, or that was elicited, was an erectile dysfunction, um, no history of steroid use. He's never had any imaging done. He's never used any phosphodiesterase inhibitors, no history of diabetes. He's had normal lipids. Neurologic exam was normal. And his eye examination when he presented, his vision in the right eye was about 20-20, left eye was count fingers. Um, he had a left after and pupillary defect. Um, visual field to confrontation. He, it was recorded that he had a supranasal defect in the right eye and generalized constriction in the left eye. Color vision was actually decreased in both eyes. The left, right eye was 4 out of 10, but couldn't see any of the color plates in the left eye. And flicker fusion was also decreased in the right eye significantly, but he wasn't even able to see the light in the left eye. <coughs> On his examination, anterior segment was pretty unremarkable. And his posterior segment examination, he had um, generalized pallor in the left nerve, possibly increased temporal pallor. The right nerve looked healthy, and cup to disc ratios were slightly increased with the um, right being 0.6 and the left being 0.7. Um, he had some, it's noted he had some AV nicking in both eyes. So here's his retinal nerve fiber layer. Fiber layer. He had actually come in with this test being done. So he had generalized thinning <coughs> of the left eye and a little bit of inferior thinning in of the right eye and some borderline, or sorry, that looks yellow there, but it's full um, 
superior nasally and temporally. So the interesting thing in this gentleman is if you just go by what we know at this point, he has a history of NAION reportedly. We don't have the records. And um, his exam potentially is consistent with NAION. Um, maybe it's, you know, the kind of the things that are a little bit odd is that he still complains of decreasing vision loss in the right eye. We don't exactly know what's happening there. But he hadn't had a visual field done up until this point. And so this was his visual field, um, which shows a, a <laughs> temporal hemianopia and, you know, not completely symmetric, but pretty um, clearly demarcated. So, of course, the next thing that he had done was imaging. And so the MRI showed this large mass or lesion, I guess you could say here. We can see it here as well. Um, and basically, the radiologist felt that this was most consistent with a giant anterior communicating artery aneurysm, which is quite rare. So, you know, looking at the literature, there is one report of a giant anterior communicating artery aneurysm that produced by temporal hemianopsia. This was back in 1981, but um, just kind of a 10-year history of headache, vomiting, neck stiffness. This was, we're lucky, this was their picture of the angiogram back then. So we definitely have a little bit better technology <laughs> to help facilitate our diagnosis these days. But um, an interesting case of this fairly, you know, a rare aneurysm causing the bitemporal hemianopsia kind of was thought to go over the optic chiasm and then push up the chiasm causing this visual field defect. So our patient had a diagnostic cerebral angiogram, and they actually, with this, diagnosed <laughs> him with a left internal carotid artery aneurysm, an ophthalmic artery, kind of carotid opth ophthalmic artery aneurysm. Um, it was fairly large, and so we can see the picture here of this large aneurysm. So just a quick review of the vascular anatomy. We're talking about his aneurysm is basically, it's on the left, but at this junction of the ophthalmic artery and the internal carotid. And you can see the close proximity, of course, to the optic chiasm. Um, so the carotid ophthalmic aneurysms, most are intradural, which present, if they're presenting, they could present as a subarachnoid hemorrhage and, of course, visual field defects that we saw and I'll talk about. But there's a few that are extradural, and then in that case, they could present as a carotid cavernous sinus fistula or a subdural hematoma. Um, in looking at these, there was a kind of a large uh, study of 2,000, about or a little over 2,000 intracranial aneurysms looked at in 1966. 5.4% um, of them were carotid ophthalmic, so not too common. They're more common in women at least reportedly, and then more frequent on the left, which is kind of interesting, um, but, and then also associated with other intracranial aneurysms. Some other reports of these aneurysms that were kind of interesting, there were three reports of aneurysms actually penetrating through the optic nerve or a chiasm, um, and then other manifestations, you can have a subarachnoid hem hemorrhage, which would damage the neural structures around the, you know, where the blood is, the vision loss. You can get emboli from within the aneurysm that would cause vision loss, um, and then compression, of course, from any of the visual s structures. Um, and so this was a, the, a report of an aneurysm. This is the aneurysm here, and you, this is the artist's rendition, but the optic nerve is just being kind of split in half by this large aneurysm. Um, and this gentleman, interestingly, had acute loss of right vision or acute loss of vision in the right eye after a severe headache but you know it was clear that aneurysm had been there for a while so they weren't exactly sure why it was th they thought he had a sentinel bleed and then kind of had this vision loss but there's <coughs> the other report of um, this ophthalmic artery aneurysm splitting the nerve this patient had no visual symptoms and no changes in her vision which is kind of amazing so there's kind of, you could pretty much see any visual field defect 
with these. The ophthalmic artery can emanate in, in different uh, orientations from the optic chiasm, so depending on where that is and where the aneurysm happens, um, it can produce different things, but, and then the aneurysm, depending on where it expands, could of course also produce different types of visual field defects. If it expands anteriorly, you could have, um, you could compress optic nerve and have a unilateral optic neuropathy. Superiorly, um, they have reports of either kind of a slow monocular vision loss or acute painful associated with a central scotoma and its lateral uh, APD, which could mimic, mimic retrobulbar optic neuritis. Um, ex if it expands posteriorly and superiorly, there's a, you could have an optic chiasm, chiasm or track syndrome. And then if it expands laterally, it can compress the lateral aspect of the optic nerve, chiasm or track, and then you can have a nasal hemianopsia in the ipsilateral eye, um, which they, you see a fair amount with them. Just looking at a few other kind of case series, in 1989, Drake looked at 103 carotid ophthalmic aneurysms, and out of his series, there were only eight males, two presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, um, and then, interestingly, 48 eyes already had a vision of 2200 or worse, and just the slowly progressive loss of vision, which is just, you know, kind of interesting that they go on for so long with this giant aneurysm and don't get diagnosed until their vision is so poor. Um, <coughs> very talked about the some of the visual field defects, but the most common that he saw were just unilateral or bilateral temporal defects. So unfortunately with these aneurysms, uh, the treatment is also not necessarily going to preserve the vision in that, especially in the side that they have the aneurysm is due to direct damage from the optic nerve or the blood supply to the nerve being disrupted or interrupted in the process of clipping the aneurysm and then any post-operative va vasospasm, you're just, you know, the, the blood source for the nerve can be um, a problem. So for our patient, he did undergo left craniotomy and had clipping of his um, ophthalmic aneurysm or carotid ophthalmic aneurysm. He, unfortunately, his postoperative course was um, complicated by an intraventricular hemorrhage with acute obstructive hydrocephalus, and they went in and evacuated his epidural hematoma, and he did well after that um, systemically. But on his post-op eye exam, so he reported that immediately post-op he didn't have any vision in the left eye. N no one evaluated him from ophthalmology, so we don't know exactly how bad it was, but he said after a few weeks his vision returned, but it was still blurry. The right eye, um, he thought, was completely resolved pretty much right after the surgery. <coughs> there was no more of this visual disturbance, no more blurriness, and the right eye was, is seen great, 2015. Left eye is still poor vision, count fingers. The APD was measured as a little bit higher um, postoperatively. Color vision in the <coughs> right eye is almost normal. Left eye still doesn't ha see any color. And then uh, visual field from his um, post-op, the right eye is definitely improved, but the left eye, there's more generalized defects and is worse. Luckily, subjectively, he doesn't think the left eye is worse, but and he's happy with the right eye, but um, I wanted to present this case because I think it's a good, another good case and kind of a scary case of when going on kind of our anchoring biases or the diagnosis that a patient comes in with can really be life-threatening in this case. And visual fields are such a easy and a non-invasive test that it's just, you know, if there's any doubt, I think you doing them can, you know, save a life. So any questions or comments? All right. I think we have Reese up next.